Welcome. Uh, this is uh, MIT broadcast out of the Media Lab talking about uh, what we're going to do after this uh, immediate lockdown and how are we going to live in the future and how can we get to the future. My name is Alex Penland. I'll be uh, the, the minor um, moderator here and help ask our questions. There's uh, Slido, which I think has been sent around so you can post things there and we'll try and get a couple questions after each talk. We have seven talks from people who are world experts in their area and have been thinking about, oh my God, what do we do now? <laughs> um, and to kick it off, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kevin, S Kevin Esfelt to talk to us about uh, biological wall uh, wildfires. Sorry, it's still early. Kevin, please. Good day, everyone. A few months ago, we had a rather lovely world. We had beautiful, flourishing forests. And then one of the sparks that's just ubiquitous in the natural world happened to land in the wrong place. And it smoldered, it grew, no one detected it in time. And now our world is something closer to this. So before we can think about what the post COVID-19 world is like, we need to talk a little bit about how exactly we can extinguish this particular biological wildfire. So what's the context? We know that it's going to be at least a year until we get a vaccine. Personally, I would, rec I would say that we have about an 83% chance of getting a good vaccine within a year. Well before then, we have a chance of coming up with chemicals that we can use to fight the fire. If a vaccine is the most powerful, the sort of thing you can drop from a plane to fight a forest fire, antivirals are the sort of thing that you can use on the ground, as long as you don't kill the trees. There's been a lot of buzz about chloroquine, things like that. You have to be really careful because the lethal dose, the concentration where you actually threaten your life, is about four times higher than the effective dose. So that's always going to be difficult. There are other candidates. There's niclosamide, there's remdesivir that you might have heard about. These could do a lot to help us dampen the flames. But for a while, our most effective measure is gonna be exactly why we're now doing this call virtually. We need to separate ourselves. That is, we're not just trees rooted in place. Rather, we can control the configuration of the forest and make it harder for the flames to leap from tree to tree. As long as we're in our homes, then the forest cannot burn as effectively because even if one grove lights up, it doesn't set off the next one. So distancing is our strategy for now, but at some point we're gonna to need to come out and that's why we need better contact tracing and other tools that will allow us to participate in what you might call the dance. Right now we're in the hammer, eventually we're gonna be in the dance. That said, right now we have a tremendous opportunity it's really quite inspiring because all of humanity now is devoted to extinguishing this wildfire, this particular conflagration that is COVID-19. But that, I would contend, is thinking too small. The reason is that historically, pandemics have been much worse than COVID-19. The 20th century was very lucky. The worst was the 1918 influenza. And even that only killed a tiny fraction of the world's population. The great plagues of the past, certainly you've heard of the Black Death. But before that, the plague of Justinian in ancient Rome, you had both the Antonine Plague and the plague of Cyprian. Both, all of those killed more than 25% of the civilizations that they affected. And now with air travel, we know that COVID-19 could could cross the world in a single day. So even though we're more resistant, we have much better tools for fighting fires, we can control where the trees are to inhibit spread, we're actually much more vulnerable in some ways as well. So what can we do? We can work to ensure that the tools we develop to extinguish this fire are general. Because this fire, focusing on this fire is thinking too small. We need to end all biological wildfires. So what does that entail? First, this was a natural spark. But in the future, we need to contend with the fact that there may be instances of arson. 
engineered wildfires could be worse than the natural variety. So how can we stop that? We need to ensure that people can't just print the DNA encoding a pathogen that could create a pandemic. And ideally, we need to do it without disclosing what we think is a pandemic. That's hard, but we have a project called Secure DNA that's an international collaboration working to do just that. Even if we take care of arson, something might slip through and nature can always throw us another curveball. So we need to develop classes of cures that are general. A vaccine is great, but ideally we want to prevent it. We can't develop a vaccine until there's already a fire. What we need are things like decoys. Every virus needs to get into our cells using a particular lock. They need to come up with a key to, that fits in that particular lock very, very precisely. But all of the viruses that affect us only use a couple of dozen receptors. That's why we and many others are working on decoy receptors, versions that the virus can't use to enter cells, but we could flood the body with because they're nearly identical to something that's already there. Then with, amidst the sea of decoys, the viruses wouldn't be able to get in. These technologies could be delivered as antiviral therapeutics, but also through gene therapy as a new vaccine that could preemptively protect us from just about any virus. Then we need to improve our ability to separate. Right now, locking everything down can be very effective, but as we all know, it's tremendously costly in ways both economic, but also social and mental. What we need are better ways of identifying who is on fire, which trees are smoldering and are likely to burst into flames, which people are asymptomatic yet still capable of transmitting a virus. We can detect that by deep sequencing serum, which will allow us to detect essentially any virus, no matter how exotic. We can also develop more specific tests based on CRISPR that are just now rolling out. And we can develop these again in advance of knowing exactly what the virus is, because we could develop them preemptively to every class of potential mammalian virus that might jump species and affect us. Finally, we can do a better job of identifying who infected whom and who was put at risk, allowing us to isolate ourselves temporarily if we're at risk while letting the rest of society go on. And that is perhaps the, our most effective tool against this particular COVID-19 wildfire, but also in defending against future ones. So whatever we develop now, let's think very carefully about how we're going to move on after this, because this is not going to be the only wildfire. Let's end them all forever. Thanks. Boy, that's super and, and I think very uh, inspiring that there, there is hope for, for having a better, more secure world. Um, I don't see a lot of questions at this point. Um, I think maybe people are still digesting this, uh, unless something pops up immediately. Um, why don't we say thank you? Uh, maybe there's room at the end. And uh, Kevin Esfeldt, uh, MIT, uh, Google him if you want to send him a note. <laughs> okay, so with uh, that then let's move on, okay? Um, so next up is uh, Ramesh Raskar, who's been working on contact tracing, safe paths. Uh, and I think you'll find this uh, also something that's uh, inspiring. Thanks. Go ahead, Ramesh. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's talk about contact tracing and creating a new toolkit, private kit, safe paths that's privacy aware and can also allow us to move towards a more resilient society. Now, we know about contact tracing. A patient in Korea, patient 31, this woman who went to the hospital for a car accident, went to a lunch, to a church, came back to the hospital, and in turn, ended up impacting more than 1,000 people. And authorities had to interview more than 1,000 people to backtrace and see who could be at risk and avoid further spread. Now, this type of social network analysis done manually is nearly impossible. And if it's done digitally, 
it could create a surveillance state. So how can we avoid this problem? Well, if you use digital contact tracing to warn individuals if they crossed path with a COVID plus person, we can indeed reduce the time it takes to inform them, help them self-isolate or take care of themselves if they're at at-risk population. And we can do that using phones. We can use GPS and Bluetooth to compute the proximity of a healthy person who might have come in contact with a COVID plus person. So that's all great. And we do this already if you use tools like Google Maps. You know, it allows you to see who else is around you and what's the traffic, you know, the reds and the greens, and gives you a safe path. And the reason we do that is because we have very little privacy. We willingly give away our location to Google and we get great utility out of it. You know, we understand how the traffic around us is. On the other hand, when it comes to health data, in this case, about infections and public health, we are very careful. You know, all the data is siloed and we have to worry about privacy, uh, and which means the utility is low as well. So in some Asian countries, we have um, seen a solution where in fact, by reducing the privacy levels, you can use digital tools to help public health authorities to contain the virus. So the question for us is, can we achieve both? Can we achieve individual privacy and still create a solution for public health? And this is where, this is where private kit and safe paths at MIT comes in. A large alliance is creating a digital contact tracing solution. Now you would say, this seems very difficult because privacy is not just about an individual, but there is consent, there is regulations like HIPAA, there are trade secrets between organizations. And of course, this is also a national security issue. And after all of that, what's the incentive? I'm already healthy. Why should I worry about a system like this? Now, some of you might say, at the same time, location data seems such a low stakes information. I think it's perfectly fine if all of us just start giving anonymized and aggregated uh, private data like location. Well, de-identification aggregation is not at all enough. Uh, if you remember Strava, the app people use for, um, for outdoor activities, release their anonymized and aggregated trails, but that ended up disclosing the outlines of US military bases in Niger and Syria. So even low stakes information like GPS coordinate could actually become a national security issue. What about Bluetooth? Bluetooth seems like it does not give away your location, but does give a proximity. Well, the challenge with that is if there is a widespread third party app that has hundreds or even billions of installations, this third party app company can start listening to all these Bluetooth beacons that are being emitted uh, by these phones and easily create re-identifiable trajectories. In fact, they're salivating right now if all phones start emitting either a token, even if it has some rotating keys. So these are not easy problems to solve and we need to think about this in a computational way as well. So private kit safe paths, which is already available now in uh, Google Play Store and Apple App Store, the version one is simple. We should wash our hands, keep social distance and start logging our personal trails in a diary completely on your phone, not share with anyone and then download data from public information uh, and assess for yourself what the risk can be. In version two, we expect public health authorities to start releasing redacted location trails and Bluetooth trails of infected people. And with redaction, provide sufficient privacy for the infected person and for everybody else, all the healthy individuals can download this data and look at the intersection on their own phones. But in version three, we would like to reduce the burden on health officials who may have to do these personal interviews and redaction and use computational methods to do semantic analysis, redaction, anonymization, aggregation, uh, blurring, merging, publishing, and any computational methods for hashing and encryption. In the background, we also need a safe places web tool for public health officials 
where at least in version one and version two, uh, you would need a patient to donate on a consent basis a 20th day trail of their GPS and, and Bluetooth. And then the health officials can redact, you know, for example, location where you live, locations where you work, or even places that should not be marked as red zone. If you just drove in your own car down the main street, there's no need to mark all of main street as you know, a red zone. Uh, and then also a tool that, as I said, allows you to anonymate, anonymize, aggregate, merge, and use computational methods for protection. And this is much faster and more accurate than a traditional patient interview. So we're working with many cities in the US and many countries worldwide uh, to deploy Safe Places web tool for public health officials, uh, and of course, the Safe Path app as well. Uh, and it's a wonderful alliance that has emerged. It's open source, available on GitHub. So we encourage you to participate uh, in many, any way you can, either by contributing code, contributing to a think tank, or also participating in the rollouts. Uh, many of the people on this call here are part of the alliance, and we are very delighted to have mentors from WHO and HHS uh, and many large organizations and faculty mem mentors that are experts, such as Ron Rivest, who will hear later in encryption, Sandy Pentland in social physics, Yoshio Bengio in machine learning, and many other organizations like COVID Watch, Open Mind, Corona Trace, and COVID Act Now, uh, who are part of this larger team. If we have tools to orchestrate and coordinate among citizens, it's not just about public health. If we have enough privacy guarantees, in the short run, we will be able to overcome the challenges of slowing the spread of the virus. But in the medium term, such orchestration tools will also allow us to restart the economy. And eventually our goal is to create resilient societies that can overcome these challenges because of man-made or natural disruptions to our social and economic fabric. Thank you. That's super, uh, Ramesh. That's really great. I hope people sort of, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of uh, stuff about um, uh, tracing in the, in the news today and things like that. Ramesh, could you take your uh, screen share off? Thank you. Ramesh? Yes. Please, yeah. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, so there's a tremendous amount of, of noise about this and it's really nice to see someone sort of putting it in context and pointing out that this is uh, something that we have to think about for reconstructing society and, uh, as Kevin was saying, have sort of more general tools. Um, I think, uh, I, again, I don't see uh, uh, questions coming up here. Again, I think people are trying to just sort of begin to wrap their heads around it. Uh, so Ramesh Raskar uh, at MIT, easy to Google him, uh, send him messages. So to hear about the, the more sort of tools that protect our privacy but allow for information flow. We have perhaps the world's expert at this, a person who's been at the forefront of uh, this sort of technology for, for decades, a Turing Prize winner, uh, Ron Rivest. Uh, please, Ron, uh, tell us Thanks, what's man. going on here. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I'm getting used to the Zoom stuff like all of us, so I, I hope you can see me okay. Um, the uh, previous two talks really set the stage nicely for this. Uh, we see that information management, information flow is critical to moving forward the century. And so both of the projects that uh, you've heard about already are, are things that uh, cryptography has started to play a key role in, uh, managing the, the information about what uh, viruses might be dangerous, what the properties they might have. Is We've got a team uh, looking at the cryptographic protection tools for that. And certainly for the contact tracing as well, we have as, as uh, Ramesh said, we want to have a tools which uh, protect privacy uh, there. And we've got a great team of cryptographers working on that uh, part as well. So uh, cryptography is turning out to be a very useful tool. As we move into the 21st century, we're going to see even more of this. One thing I'd like to talk about here then would be uh, a, a different application uh, where cryptography can also play a role. And that's one of the most challenging uh, design problems for uh, cryptographers and society, I think, which is that of voting. So as we move into the 
uh, elections coming up in November and then beyond, we can ask ourselves, what is voting going to be like both this year and in the future? And uh, what tools do we have to make it uh, more secure and more trustable? And it's a, um, it's a challenge. We have uh, the internet, we have lots of digital technology, and one might think of that the way forward uh, with voting is to use that technology as we use it for many other applications uh, to make voting more accessible, more secure, some more usable somehow. But uh, if that is a path that we've seen turned out to be fraught with various kinds of security risks. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that and talk about what cryptography might do for, for us. I mean, so voting over the internet is a commonly uh, postulated dream. We may get there someday, but I think that's a long path yet. So what do we want from a voting system? I think it's good to start off with, you know, what does it take to, ru to run a democracy? We wanna have elections. Uh, you want to know that your vote is cast the way you intended it. You want to know, know that it's collected the way you cast it. And you want to know that it was counted the way it was collected. So there's three properties. Each of those should be verifiable. And so we'd like to have a verifiably correct result. If we can verify each of those steps, we can trust that the votes were cast as intended, collected as cast, counted as collected, and we get the right result. But verification of these things is... Um, stymied in part by the need for a secret ballot. This is the, huge, the thing that makes a huge difference between voting and say something like banking, where you have people having accounts and you get statements at the end of every month and you can check where, where your money went and so on too. You can't really check where your vote went quite so easily because your vote needs to be decoupled from your identity uh, so you can't sell your vote. You don't wanna be able to point to a vote and say, that's my vote because if you could do that, you could also say, now give me the $20 because that's how you paid me to vote. And so we wanna prevent vote selling. That makes voting a much more challenging application. Nonetheless, we'd like to have evidence-based elections. We'd like to have this verification procedure allow you to check that we have um, counted, collected, cast, collect, counted, and collected the, the uh, votes properly. And so the, the thing you want at the end of the day is evidence that the outcome is correct. You'd like to say, you've lost this election. Don't just uh, complain about the, having lost. You know, if you really want to check that you've lost, here's the evidence uh, for why you lost. Here's the votes. You know, you can count, recount them yourself or whatever. Uh, and, and you have a pile of evidence that's credible, it's public, and that anybody can, can uh, check. So that's the goal, is to have evidence-based elections where losing candidates can check that they've lost uh, fair and square. So one of the problems we have with evidence-based elections is the trust we might need to place in software or hardware. Uh, and we have seen so far that we don't know how to get software right. Uh, software is vulnerable to being manipulated, infected, uh, and otherwise abused. And so we'd like to have a, syst a voting system which is software independent. Software independence is a term that's uh, become defined in the voting world to mean that an undetected undetected change in the software, possibly maliciously inserted or, or just otherwise, an undetected change in the software isn't gonna cause an undetectable change in the outcome. And that's, that's the definition of software independence. And one of the problems with our digital systems is they're just not software independent. The only way to uh, create the data, to access the data, to, to check the data is to go through a pile of software that you need not trust. Uh, you don't wanna trust if you have to. Uh, voting is so important that people will go to any lengths to corrupt an election, it seems. So we want to have a voting system that's software independent and uh, uh, you know, verifiable. So to date, the best technologies for that seem to be low tech, which if you're a security person may not be surprising. If you're uh, an ordinary geek, it may seem surprising. We've got all this wonderful technology, but technology gives you complexity and complexity gives you insecurity typically. When the more complex a system you have, the more openings there are to, to defeat it somehow. So uh, simple tech is better for voting. And the simple tech that we have for voting now is a good choice. We have paper ballots. You vote on a paper ballot and you submit that somehow and, and it's counted and it can be recounted and the paper ballots form the evidence. So we may see paper ballots persist a long ways into the 21st century. And that's probably a good choice. Uh, maybe down the road we can figure out how to make the digital tech work for us. Uh, we've got some ideas and I'll mention them in a minute. But paper ballots and then using some counting procedure or some statistically efficient 
version of the recounting procedure called a risk limiting audit can give you confidence that the outcome is correct. So we have uh, low tech ways of, of dealing with that. If we try to move online, we see that we have uh, issues, the two major issues being one malware and the other the uh, lack of authentication we have of remote users. But there are uh, some technologies being explored for doing this electronically. And, and I just mentioned the buzzword end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted voting, right? So E2E -E voting. And this enables you to cast a vote in encrypted form. It gets posted on a website. You can check it. You can check that the tallying was done right. It's a bit complicated, but there are prototype pilot implementations making this work. Cryptography plays a key role in that. So down the road, we can imagine maybe having some cryptographically based voting schemes, which are trustable and give us the right results even over the, over the internet. But that, I think that's a decade or two off probably. Uh, so right now, don't vote over the internet, vote, vote, vote on your paper ballots. But in the, few, the, the later part of the century, you know, we'll see things change. I'll stop there. Great. Great. Thank you very much. That's, that's uh, good to hear that there's hope for getting this right. I think this probably also applies to uh, cash, which is being replaced, and people are talking about central governments directly controlling all cash transactions through cryptocurrencies. And it sounds like this is something that's going to be important there as well. Yes, yeah, so we've seen the, the rise in Bitcoin and things like that, and I think that... Uh, uh, yeah, but beyond that, I mean, you know, they're, they're talking about the central government uh, controlling all cash uh, transactions, which are currently uh, relatively anonymous, uh, but then would be visible to the central government. Yes, yes. As we, as we make things more digital, we end up falling into the trap over and over again of building a surveillance state around us. And this happens with uh, physical location movement, as we saw with Ramesh's talk. It happens with currency, as, as, as you see, too. So we have to think about ways of protecting your privacy. Cryptography is a key tool for making some of this private. Uh, it can protect the identities of individuals. And so I think we need to identify where a surveillance state risk is and figure out what the tools are to prevent it. OK, super. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to turn to, OK, how do we live with this? What do we do? How do we construct our society? in this world that's gonna inevitably connect, uh, have a lot of virtual stuff. And I guess I'm the next one up. Uh, so let me uh, see if I can do that. There we are. And um, so what I wanna talk about is, uh, what do you do when you have to go virtual? And, and the problem as we all know now is, is that you lose a lot. Uh, it's a wicked problem if you have to separate people, uh, okay, because of the, the infection, but now you lose uh, the culture of your, of your organization. So there's no informal interaction, and all the science says that these informal interactions, the things that aren't on the org chart, uh, are, uh, promote better decisions, and in fact, they account for maybe 40% of the performance in your decision-making. So that means suddenly your decisions are going to be much more uh, things that have only a few voices, you get herd mentality, things like that. And that's going to be a problem. Similarly, um, you get this sort of notion that causes this that comes from a few people who are very extroverted online and everybody else begins to feel like they're really not part of the solution. So trust uh, decreases, Harvesting of ideas, uh, your ability to sense the environment goes down. Um, a lot of that is due to poor habits of interaction. We're used to all these signals that we get face to face and, and habits we have for working in groups. And online, a lot of that stuff doesn't work anymore. And so your organization begins to fall apart. Uh, people feel like they're just putting in time only because of the money. They don't feel like they're part of the, the overall solution. And of course, what that means is your ability to coordinate and act as a unit uh, decreases dramatically. And finally, when people feel separated from everything, uh, they begin to have far more mental health problems. And uh, the major thing in maintaining uh, mental health 
turns out to be positive social interactions, rich social interactions. Online doesn't seem to do it nearly as well as uh, something that's face-to-face, -face, but face-to-face -face is difficult now. So what do you do? Well, I'm gonna go through a series of solutions and ideas to help all these. You can't do it completely, but um, uh, you can begin addressing these problems. So you have to manage the trade-offs between uh, separating because of infection and coordinating uh, through these little narrow pipes that are, are uh, what we're doing right now. So um, one of the first things to think about is, is, is that when you minimize the physical infection risk by minimizing interaction, you're also minimizing idea flow, the ability to harvest ideas within your organization. This is a general problem that we've traditionally had to address in government. So for instance, we're used to in a, a group sort of looking around and saying, okay, do people agree with this? And uh, you can sort of sense when people aren't on the same, um, uh, same page. And so we came up with a notion of secret voting, uh, a representative democracy. So people vote for things, the leader still makes the final decision, uh, but that way the leader can get a more certain uh, view of what the group thinks. Another version of this, it's more uh, uh, broader for harvesting is idea markets. They've been tried for decision making, uh, but uh, the idea of people contributing data, voting other ideas up and stuff, gives you a way to see what are the memes that are traveling around in your organization uh, while you're trying to minimize the viruses <laughs> floating around in your organization. And in democracy, uh, that's the role of the free press. So those, you can sort of think about this as you've you're got a government and you're trying to run it as opposed to the sort of more classic way that you think about organizations. Um, to do a lot of this, you have to actually measure things. You have to measure what are the patterns of communication? Do you have silos? Uh, are the right groups actually talking to each other online, in Slack, by phone? Uh, and occasionally face-to-face -face as, as possible. Uh, and based on that, take action. And I'll recommend a, a couple of companies that have spun out of my group just uh, as examples of the sort of thing that you can do, uh, not that you have to use them. So Humanize, for instance, looks at all these digital trails and tries to figure out where there's silos, where there's uh, problems in, in communication more generally. Um, another sort of trade-off is to try and make sure that everybody is heard. So in group meetings, you get these people that don't speak up. Now, physically, people are more used to that. You can detect it because you're there. But online, people just forget to, to make sure that everybody is heard. And uh, that means people begin to lose trust and, and identity with organizations. And Beth Porter, who's going to speak uh, next, actually, I think is going to talk about that. She runs a, a, a CEO of a startup called Riff Analytics. And she'll get into that. Um, you also need to maintain mental health. And so there's lots of ways to try to do that. You can have virtual teas. You can have buddies, things like that. That certainly helps. But you, sometimes you need professional care. And there's a new generation of online Healthcare, for instance, Ginger.io, another spinoff, uh, is well known for guaranteeing professional mental health support in under 60 seconds. And, and some large companies have adopted that for all their workers uh, to combat isolation. Um, you also need to have constructive interaction. And, and that is people speaking to each other correctly, listening. Um, nodding your heads at the right time or saying, uh-huh. And uh, there are companies that begin to do this. Microsoft has a product. We have a spinoff called Cogito Corporation that does this for call centers in particular, but also within organizations. And finally, um, you want to consider the physical reconstruction of your organization uh, after this immediate sort of lockdown is done. So, we're used to a model of this very centralized. Everybody drives into the city. Um, but 
you can also imagine having local workspaces in each uh, uh, town. Now, local workspaces means that the connection uh, graph for the virus is broken. So it's very slow to have things spread throughout the entire organization. And of course, it has you know, green implications and less commuting time, but it still provides that social support. And idea flow between different parts of the organization if you have those people sort of co-located. And I think uh, Kent Larson is gonna talk about that uh, uh, at the end here. So um, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, you need to think about this stuff and really take active energy to be able to um, manage your organization in these sort of virtual and semi-virtual things. You're all experts at sensing what's going on with other people in a physical way. You're not experts at doing that online. A lot of the cues you use to be able to tell when something's important or not important, a lot of the informal communication disappears. And those are major problems. And you need to take a lot of your energy right now in particular to trying to fix those things because they're not going to go away. Uh, as Kevin was saying, you know, there's going to be more sparks and more waves and new things coming along. And we need to move to a new normal that includes a lot of distance interaction. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I uh, wanted to tell you and introduce uh, some of the other people. Let's see. So I don't see questions there. Um, so we're doing on time. We're doing good. Let's just move on to the next person, with is Beth Porter. Beth, please. Thanks, Sandy, and thanks for the intro. Yeah, I'm going to uh, share my screen very briefly uh, here. Let me just make sure I can actually do it. <laughs> Always a trick. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about remote work and uh, the specific thing that we do at uh, RIF, but then just talk about it more generally. So, you know, here we are today, we're all talking about uh, this uh, causing us to uh, sort of have to work like this, <laughs> but that's so cozy looking and seems like such a pleasant way to work. And really it looks more like this, which is that you're sort of wrestling with your kids, your dog, your family, noise in the background, everything is sort of uh, crammed, you're all crammed together with uh, everybody else in your family who's trying to do the same thing, whether it's school or work or just trying to run your household. So there's a lot going on, it's very stressful. And at the same time, you're really trying to, you know, behave like a professional, you're trying to uh, maintain both social connectedness with your uh, family and friends and your work colleagues, um, probably many of whom you spend a lot more time with than some of the members of your family. Um, you're trying to maintain efficacy while working together with others. So it's not just that you want to feel connected to them. You actually want to keep being able to do your jobs uh, well. And um, you're trying to maintain focus throughout the day. And it's a day filled with video meetings now. I mean, we'll, I'll get into that in a second. And again, you're really trying to balance, you know, work and life, and it's uh, challenging on many levels. So, um, you know, I'm just going to say this out loud. A lot of online meetings really, really suck. And there, you know, there's a, I'll get into video versus teleconference in a second, but really remote meetings often encourage not just uh, silent, uh, you know, certain silent voices not to be heard, but actually damaging behaviors, uh, lots of in, uh, interruption and um, a failure to really connect with other people, an erosion of trust, uh, unproductive dynamics that don't really uh, lead you to be able to make decisions or, or accomplish anything. And you have this sort of sentiment like this, this woman <laughs> on the video, on the um, image here, wondering like, when's the meeting going to end? And can I get on to the next thing? And, and now you have a whole day of them. It's not just one meeting that you're sort of tolerating online or a couple. It, it's all day. And um, and and you're wondering, well, what well, maybe we don't, oops, hold on. Um, maybe we don't, Maybe we shouldn't have so many video meetings. Maybe we should have just phone calls. And uh, maybe we should go back to having a less sort of in your face, stressful, I'm in the side of this Zoom box and I'm in a wall full of, you know, Zoom uh, images and, um, and sort of feel a little bit imprisoned by that. It's very stressful. Uh, there's an article Sandy was talking about before we got on today about how uh, being in video meetings actually causes a lot of stress. 
Um, and, you know, so then the, the flip side is that in a teleconference, you actually have a really hard time building rapport. There's, there's no verb, uh, no nonverbal cueing or a very small amount of, um, you know, ability to affect the meeting in that way. Uh, there's a hesitance of people to speak. People don't pay attention. You know, you know all the issues with teleconferences. You, you get on and then you mute and then you say nothing. So um, we uh, put together some uh, technology and a little bit of uh, machine learning in the background to uh, produce a, a product called uh, Riff and it's designed to help people engage better in online meetings by providing real-time feedback. And it looks a lot like everything else you use, but one of the subtle things that's there that isn't in um, regular meetings is that you get feedback about who's speaking. We are uh, privacy preserving. We don't um, care what you're saying. We only care that you've spoken and we use just the vocal, vocal record to, uh, to do the tracking that we do. And we only give that data back to people who are actually in the meeting. Uh, we give aggregate data to organizations um, to see sort of trends and, you know, uh, sort of do tracking of culture and, and see how people are, are doing across the organization. But the meeting data goes only to the, the meeting participants. Um, we give feedback after the meeting is over about uh, sort of the interaction dynamics and we have this set of metrics that really track that. Uh, speaking time is an obvious one, but we have uh, these other three metrics, influence, interruption, and affirmation. Uh, influence is really about how people affect one another in dyads. And it's, um, you know, if I have a very good re interaction with one person in a meeting and it ends up being sort of the dominant force of the meeting, you can see that here in the influence graph. And if I have a very low interaction uh, sort of pattern with somebody else, I'm not as influenced by them and maybe that person and, and I am not having as much of a rapport. So you get to see all of that in this metric afterwards and uh, sort of examine that and, and make some changes and we're, continuing to work on other feedback mechanisms. But in the research that we've done, uh, we had an NSF grant last year. Um, we've shown that te teams actually do perform better on shared tasks and, um, and make teams smarter. They do, they do better, they have more trust, um, they have a, a better rapport when they get feedback like this and can understand, build awareness, and then control their behaviors going forward. But of course, in all things, technology is only half the story. You can't actually spend the whole day on a video call. It's actually impossible. It creates too much stress, too much attentiveness, ex creates extreme cognitive load. And uh, there's a lot of science there around what your brain can tolerate. Um, and so, you know, when we talk with people about using Riff, it's not just use it, it'll be great. You know, we really try to be very um, oriented toward learning how to be a more sort of thoughtful uh, video meeting participant. And, um, and have smaller meetings that are shorter and more purposeful, give people active roles, and, and try not to conflate what is a meeting where you're trying to get productive work done with a presentation or a broadcast, which is really different. Even, however, in a presentation or a broadcast, you know, there are some techniques for giving people more to do when they're there. So activities, breakouts, short breaks, something to engage the listener. And those are all not things that you can just do overnight. It's a thoughtful set of work that needs to be done organizationally to really change the dynamic of how we use um, video. You can give us feedback about RIF. Um, we are running a private beta right now, and I'll leave this briefly up on the screen. Um, just for people to note it if they want to. And we're also going to be, we normally, you know, work with enterprises, but we're going to be releasing a self-service version of the, uh, of the video conferencing software called Riff Remote, and that'll be available also on our, on our website soon. So I'll stop there and um, give back the screen share if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. We're all stuff. learning the tools. Here. <laughs> but um, anyway, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Beth. Um, so we're not getting a lot of questions here, but I think that was uh, pretty clear about what to happen uh, and the importance of that everybody's experiencing day by day now. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, let's move on, though, sticking to time here. Um, Esteban, uh, you're next. And Esteban is uh, doing sort of what Beth was doing, but at a large scale across entire cities. 
and trying to figure out who's left out, who's put in, and what we can do about it. So Esteban, please take it away. You're muted, Esteban. I'm sorry, Ima, again. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. I think you can see my screen right now. So yeah, I'm going to actually build on, on both Beth and, and Kevin was talking uh, there, um, earlier. It's about how we're going to reconnect our society. Now I'm going to actually stress a little bit about uh, that already our society was fragile in the, in the sense of how we are connected and what are the implications of having social distancing. And, and the fact that we are going to have probably social distancing for a long time, uh, what is the implications of that in, in how we work and how we actually relate? and especially about problems like inequality and segregation. Well, Kimi was talking about this. This is actually the phases we are right now. We are right now in the hammer phase of the epidemics in which we have a strict social distances, uh, distancing policies, strict lockdowns, mobility restrictions. Uh, most likely we are gonna have to wear a mask, uh, all of us in the near future. Um, most of us are working from home. Some of them are, some people are actually staying home. Uh, because they have symptoms, etc. Hopefully, the hammer is going to uh, um, decrease the number of uh, the cases that we have. But then we have to figure out what is going to happen probably in one month or in two months. And this is going to start the phase of what we call the dance, in which we have to actually prevent the second wave, prevent that the one we reconnect our society, there's going to be a second wave of infection. And the way to do that is probably by doing contact tracing or to do targeting quarantine or to ban larger gatherings, so for example, tying up when needed. This is gonna have a tremendous cost, cost in, the, in our society, in our business and our, how we work. And I'm gonna comment also about that. The question uh, right now, it's actually how we're gonna do this. And also before that, whether the hammer is working. Uh, so the hammer, is it working? It is really, I mean, effective, like people are actually behaving as they should. Um, and this is actually what we are doing right now by monitoring aggregated data that comes from mobile phone, mobile phones. We are actually using real time data that comes from a number of services, a number of mobile phone providers um, that allow us to understand where people is moving, how they are moving, and if they are not moving at all. On, this is the map of the census tracts in the New York area. And on the left, you see what was uh, the mobility of people uh, before uh, the lockdown measures. And on the right, you, have, you can see the mobility of people were when the lockdown uh, measures were introduced in, uh, so one, one is the weekend of the March the 6th, and the other one is the weekend of March the 20th. The colors here indicate how much people are moving. And then we see that we, people went from moving around 50 to 60 kilometers, let's say per day, because of the commuting in different areas, to basically nothing. So basically right now people are moving less than two or three kilometers uh, every day. So it is working. I mean, and actually um, by looking at the data, we can see that the, these lockdown measures are working. The most important part of this is that it's not why, why people, whether people are moving or not. The most important part is whether people are contacting each other or not. And this is actually what we can do also with mobile phone data. And we can see how many contacts per day people have in the New York area. This is a time series. You can clearly see the pattern, the weekly pattern where people get out on during the weekends uh, to the food places, for example, and they get a lot of contacts there. But then once the national emergency and the school closures took effect in the New York area, the number of contacts has decreased for around 75 to five. So it's a 93% decrease in the number of contacts. So yes, it is happening. I mean, the number of contacts is happening. It's the social distance measurements are actually effective and, and, and this is uh, translating into the number of contacts. But still you can see that there is a residual number of contacts. So that means that probably the food places and the restaurants are not the new trenches. We don't have to focus on those because they are closed down. So where is the new trench? Where is the contact happening? What should we focus our attention right now? We should be focusing our attention to groceries. Groceries, this you can see here, this is the time series of the, where the contacts are happening right now, the fraction of contacts. And even though the number of contacts right now is very small, most of them are happening in the groceries. You can clearly see that food was, were more, most of the contacts were happening before, but now more, more contacts are happening in our groceries. So the new trenches and the new focus of uh, policymakers and also health officials should be in groceries, apart from obviously the hospital situation. And I'm gonna come back about the impact of groceries in a minute. 
The other question is about, well, I mean, we probably have all these contact tracing applications as Ramesh was, was suggesting, you know, we have all, uh, all the software to work on, online. online. Uh, but the question is that how much uh, we, will, we will need to implement those measures uh, for the dance to work. And this actually, it's a very complicated question. And I'm just showing you here, the kind of epidemic models that people are using right now to understand this question. Each of the letters that you see here in this transparency is a state. It's actually going from the susceptible, this on the green, which is basically people which is not infected, going to the latent state, which is the L, to the P state, which is the pre-symptomatic state, to the I, which is the infected, and then depending on your trajectory, you can go to the hospital, you can go to a hospital that has uh, ICU, you can go to a hospital that doesn't have ICU, or you can go to a hospital that goes, that has an ICU, but that doesn't have ventilators. So different routes, you can have different routes by having different um, um, uh, epidemic, let's say episodes. The question is the red box there. I mean, we want to prevent that people go to that route and that the hospitals and the people that go to that route actually is minimized so the hospital can cope with that thing. So what we are doing right now is to use uh, a simulation of 10 uh, K agents using real-time mobility data in the Boston area to try to understand how many people are gonna get into that route. And what is the strategy that is gonna prevent people going to that route, to the red box. And actually we found one of them that is gonna work, which is basically uh, based on contact tracing. Uh, it requires that people that are symptomatic and are pre-symptomatic and are infected actually are quarantined more than 15, um, more than 14 days, around 14 days, but also they need to be, uh, we need to do contact tracing up to the first contact, okay? And the number of contact tracing has to be at least of 20% of the people that have uh, contact with this person. So that strategy works. It's gonna lower the number of people going to the hospitals below what is the capacity of the Boston area, of the beds in the, in the Boston area, and this is gonna work. But it requires, as I was telling you, that symptomatic people stay home, that the household is quarantined for, for two weeks, and also that 20% of the uh, uh, contacts are recovered by our contact tracing applications. And, Finally, I want to insist in two things that uh, Sandy was talking about our workplaces. Um, Kevin was talking about probably what is going to happen for in the future for all the pandemics. I'm going to try to talk, tell you about more about the social fabric of cities. There are two questions that I think are important to keep in mind when we do the dance. I mean, where when we are going to switch on the works, the restaurants, the workplaces, etc. The first question is about this: cities are super linear, meaning that for example, you can see, for example, on the left, this is a plot of the GDP of cities as a function of the total population. The black line is the linear uh, relationship, meaning that the GDP will be linear to the total population, but it's not linear. The fact that we live in societies which are clumped together in, in cities is, is actually giving an extra uh, value to us. So there is an extra value of being connected. And the fact that we are disconnected right now is probably meaning that we are going to come down to the to the black um, uh, line. So there's a value of being connected. And uh, we have to keep this in mind because if we are gonna work from home, probably we're gonna end up in the black line again. So we need to be connected, we need to be in society, and we need to maximize social capital, as I was saying in the, in the title, while minimize propagation. The worrisome part is that you can see on the right that some people have found that the growth rate of the COVID-19 infection actually is proportional to the population too. So we have to combine these two things. We need a social capital, we need that people get together, but we need to minimize this. So I don't have a solution for this, but whatever we do, we have to keep in mind that there's a balance between the left and the right in this transparency. The other thing is this, right now, because of social distances, social distancing policies, we have never been so segregated in America in the recent times. We spend our, the, most of our time living in our neighborhood. We are, we are more or less 100% segregated right now. This is, the average, this is a plot in which I show you how segregated are the places in the United States as a function of the distance you have to travel to them. You can see, for example, that except cultural events are actually the places in which we get less segregated, while grocery stores and schools are the places in which we get more segregated. Because of social distancing, we have closed this. And we are actually only going to grocery stores which are already segregated. So we have to keep this in mind. We are actually destroying the social fabric of our cities and we are segregating ourselves more. 
So whatever we do in the future, we have probably to start reconnecting places in which we get less energy. Whatever we do in the future, let's maximize social capital and minimize epidemics. Thank you. Super, super. So as Esteban said, you know, the, the point here is, is, is that these connections are not just nice to have, they're really the thing that, that lets us be more creative, brings uh, uh, increase in productivity, innovation, and they're pretty much exactly the same thing that spreads uh, the infection. So we have a wicked problem that we have to uh, deal with. How are we gonna do these two things? And almost like I planned this, <laughs> uh, the next speaker is gonna tell us a little bit about that. So Kent Larson, uh, please take it away. Kent, you're- uh, I there. got it, okay. I'm getting it. Super. How about that? Your video seems to be off, at least from my perspective. Uh, it says, uh, the host has stopped it, unable to start video. Um, that's weird. So, Esteban, you're not screen sharing or anything, right? I think it's something the host has to do. I don't know even who no. the host is. Oh, there it goes. Okay, somebody allowed Okay, me. there we are. Okay, good. Got it, got it, great. Thank you. Go for it, Kevin. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Esteban created a, a nice segue for me. I, I want to talk about uh, rethinking urban resilience in a post-pandemic world. Uh, and uh, urban resilience is a little bit like smart cities. I mean, it means different things to different people. And there are many, many projects around the world thinking about urban resilience. These are just a few uh, diagrams. Uh, but the reality is, for the most part, it's focused on climate change, you know, the impact of storms and flooding and, and whatnot, and, and uh, very precious little investigation has involved the impact of, of pandemics. So there, there's a, uh, quite a bit of fairly silly talk about how cities are obsolete because of density, et cetera, but the reality is cities are centers of the pandemic precisely because they're centers of capital and culture and innovation and cities are not going away. This is, um, this is one of the great boulevards uh, in, in a different era last fall uh, when they shut down traffic for a day, Champs-Élysées in, in Paris. Uh, and in a case of really extraordinary bad timing, February 18th, we opened an exhibition, was part of an exhibition to re, to re uh, imagine the Champs Elysees. So, in, in uh, this study, we're looking at bringing people together, increasing social interactions, uh, minimizing traffic, adding all kinds of amenities. We built an agent based model that could look at different scenarios. Uh, this is uh, Anne Hidalgo, the Paris of Mayor, looking uh, at our city scope model that we deployed there. But this is the boulevard today, it's completely empty. Uh, streets are empty in, in all major cities at this point. So we're, we're beginning to rethink all of these ideas uh, in light of recent events and uh, uh, continuing to develop this idea that the city should be a network of community networks. We, we look to the past when, particularly uh, 18th, 19th century, where communities were where people lived, worked, played, interacted, created, et cetera, thinking to the future, distributed energy systems, food, water, data, mobility, public policy, and, and grappling with what does this mean for us today? Now, Paris is actually an interesting city that unlike most new cities, uh, it's a, it is a network of neighborhood, the 20 arrondissement, and, uh, outside of every door, essentially within a few minute walk are physicians and pharmacies and food networks. Uh, this is a, a study we did a while ago, the transportation survey at, uh, uh, at MIT, looking at the movements of people every day into the district. Now we looked at this 
in terms of energy consumption, but you can imagine infected people spreading the virus to people in the community, uh, in the surrounding areas uh, daily. And we looked at what happened if we, if, if the Volpe Center was uh, created an opportunity to add all of the amenities and the diverse, diverse housing that was necessary to allow Kendall Square to be a real compact innovation district where people lived and worked and played. Now, how do you get there? We're thinking about uh, dynamic algorithmic zoning regulations. This is a conventional zoning. You have separated functions, shopping area, residential, business area. Uh, in a high density city, you have subway networks that connect them all. Now, if you created functional autonomy, like uh, many of the older cities have to some degree, you reduce the commuting between those districts and uh, allow for more local access. And in the event of a pandemic, you can more easily isolate that district and still maintain walkable access to all the local uh, amenities, shops and food and healthcare, et cetera, something that most people in the US do not have. So uh, the Kendall Square property is controlled by relatively few number of people, uh, corporations and uh, international property developers. Only a few functions are ever built. But if we could move towards a dynamic incentive process with real time data feeds that would promote pro-social land use, so you could have housing in sync with the jobs, uh, grocery stores, pharmacy, daycare, community health center, think all the things we don't have in Kendall Square. And this could all be adjusted according to changes in technology or economic conditions, social conditions, or uh, whatever. And the goal there would be to achieve a kind of civic homeostasis, something I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a minute. Now, one, one of the things we're looking at is having layers of visualization. So here, red, bad, green, good. Red, in this case, is uh, walkable, lack of walkable access to parks. So you can dynamically look at uh, different layers of uh, walkable access, healthcare, mass transit, et cetera. The second thing we, 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 that I think we need to think about is privacy by design, open data networks. We've done a lot of work with telecom data. We have uh, analyzed three years of telecom data from, uh, from Andorra. We can have a pretty good understanding of patterns of living and working, where people gather, where they move, kind of work that Esteban presented. But it, it's not really ac accessible in a real-time manner and an agile enough manner to deal with the realities of a pandemic. Um, and Ramesh talked uh, ab about one application that for contact tracing. We're, one project we're just beginning is to think about how uh, we can address the economic issues, in particular, in this case, how to get a factory back to work during a pandemic. And there are three components that we think are important. One is the contact tracing but also immunity credentials. So you can uh, establish the status of an employee entering the workplace. Bluetooth beacons in the workplace, fine grain understanding of movement and activity. And finally, an agent-based sim simulation that would um, allow you to uh, minimize transmission while maintaining productivity. This is a little study we did for a factory looking at how people queue, how they're scheduled, Etc. And I think this uh, eventually could be a, quite a powerful tool to look at different scenarios. Places of living as workplace and healthcare hubs, uh, just like Beth showed, this is the reality of working at home for many people, for many of my uh, students and staff that have young families, this is the reality they're living. We, we have been looking at different uh, strategies for making housing smaller, much more affordable, but to dynamically reconfigure according to need. Beds, for example, that convert to living areas. Um, but what, what has happened recently is we realized that the, the home really needs to be a much more carefully designed workplace and healthcare node. Uh, my brother, who's an oncologist, shifted from meeting people in person to all meetings by Zoom literally in the last week. Uh, in this case, it's a small, highly designed office with a Zoom green screen 
lots of ideas we can do. Uh, urban mobility, I mean, this is the reality of transit in most cities, not exactly the, the mode of, of uh, transit that you would uh, ideally have in an epidemic. Uh, we've, if you can create these more functional, integrated, functionally autonomous uh, districts, then you can imagine all kinds of new modes. Now we we're of course having to question the workability in a pandemic of shared systems where multiple people are touching, in this case, a uh, shared three wheeler or or uh, the the blue bikes that we have in Boston. Interesting issue. Um, <clears throat> anyway, with these and many more innovations, one can imagine ways that you can move from a fairly dysfunctional community to one that is much more resi resilient. Uh, we have different ways of analyzing it, but in this case, we're looking at environmental performance and resilient as a function of density, diver diversity, proximity, and we can introduce different innovations and, and begin to, to model what the, the impact might be. Algorithmic zoning with dynamic incentives, transformable live workplaces, um, tokenized fractional ownership, I didn't have time to talk about, but that's another important piece. Production near consumption also, and you can see if we do this right, you can have the environmental performance go uh, improve basically CO2 emissions being reduced and resilience uh, going up. And I'll just end with this if I have a minute. So this is the notion of moving from fragile systems to resilience. So what's fragile that's become apparent in the last literally few months? Over-optimized supply chains. We need to move to production near consumption. Data networks designed for corporate, not societal interest. We need to move to privacy by design, open access. Rigid living and working places move to more transformable, adaptable places. Lack of close proximity to resources. We need to move to a kind of civic homeostasis and functional autonomy. Unsafe mass transit. Transition quickly to walkability, multiple lightweight modes. And maybe most importantly, we now have complex systems with single points of failure and we need to move to much more distributed systems with redundancy. So rethinking urban resilience in a post-pandemic world. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. So uh, all really good. Can you stop the screen share for a minute here? Um, so uh, Kent Larson, he's at MIT also, you can send an email. Um, we have a couple of questions and we have about uh, five minutes to do them. So um, I'll just begin that. Uh, so there's a question to Kevin. Uh, what's your most optimistic and pessimistic scenario for next year? So in brief, we're already above my 5% lower bound for a number of deaths, but we're several orders of magnitude below my 95% upper bound for likely deaths. We're not going to get a widespread, widely distributed vaccine by before a year from now. That is, we might have one that works by December, but scale up in manufacturing to make hundreds of millions of billions of doses is going to take much longer. So my most optimistic scenario is the first vaccines work. They're really, really effective. We also find that chloroquine works well enough to start saving lives. Hopefully we'll run trials on niclosamide and remdesivir. Hopefully we'll roll out the sort of safe paths and automated contact tracing in a privacy preserving way in the next month. And that will really hit it down, will improve hygiene, people will take this seriously, and we'll get a reprieve maybe because of seasonality. Doesn't unfortunately look like that's happening much, but it might help. So that's the optimistic scenario. Then we might be able to get to a position in most of the world where China is now. That is keeping it under control at a low burden of infection until we get a vaccine very quickly. Worst case scenarios, we're at a defined disadvantage relative to countries that can do that because we can't create privacy and freedom preserving tools that are as effective as the centralized authoritarian kind. I would say that's worse than any death toll that I could give you. That's right, good, good. And we also have to consider that uh, there is this trade-off as if you throw the economy into depression, 
than uh, his, not a short V thing, but a long-term depression, uh, death rates from other things go up pretty dramatically too. So it's sort of a lot of wicked trade-offs there. So the second question is for Ramesh, uh, asking to clarify the difference between public data used in your version one and version two. Uh, how would I use it in V1 to be safer? Yes, so in terms of uh, V1 and V2, the notion is that you can achieve privacy in two ways. Either you can do all the calculations on your phone, and for healthy user, that creates privacy automatically, or use the computational methods to contact the server and do some uh, you know, check for any intersection uh, with an infected person. Um, so in V1 and V2, all the, all the calculations happen on the phone. So as you, as you saw, uh, Governor Baker at, in Massachusetts just announced yesterday that they're gonna use a lot of talent uh, from Harvard to start doing uh, analog contact tracing, uh, which we were not doing as well. There's a whole organization being sprung up in many states now to do analog contact tracing, and that information should start coming out uh, in the next few days. Uh, and it's already happening in many Asian countries. Uh, and then we are working with WHO to see how this can also be implemented in Africa and, and South America. So it's pretty exciting to see that you know, all these governments uh, who uh, are, are changing the protocols to start realizing redacted and possibly encrypted data of uh, infected individuals. And as Kevin said, I think we are at this very interesting window of opportunity where we, even if we cannot scale the testing as much as we can, all we need is fever trace and isolate. If there's fever, we can conservatively assume it's because of COVID-19. Uh, and then just use that to create an early warning system for anybody else who might have come in contact with and continue the function. And as, a, as Kent said, if you want to start using it for factories and workplaces, that's a good enough early warning system that will uh, that will prevent us from doing kind of wholesale shutdowns and we can do very selective interventions in those places. That's super. Something Kevin said to me earlier was that uh, while the sort of full testing won't be available for a while. Temperature sensing is something like 88% effective. That's right. uh, and, and in part, it's because the flu has died out completely because of the social distancing. Uh, so that's some good news. Get those thermo sensors going everywhere. Um, the next question uh, is to me, Beth and Esteban, but I'm just going to give it to Beth and Esteban. And it's how uh, thoughts about how culture and social class affect social interaction patterns during the hammer dance and better future. How do we address this? Uh, I'll just say one quick thing. I think that um, one of the things that I've noticed is that social interactions online are going to move from being what I would say very have been very stilted, right? Like you either have a very, very social interaction domain or you have the stilted domain of workplace interactions. And I think what you're gonna see is that those two things look more alike than before. And that may be somewhat good and somewhat bad in that you know people really enjoy the separation of work and, and home, right? That's, that's one of the things we sort of hold dear. We're like, okay, my, I'm gonna leave my workplace and I'm gonna go home and that's my space for my, myself and my family. And, uh, and I'm gonna leave work behind. And so we have to be looking at what those two things look like together. I think Ken had a great picture there where you have the person in the closet sort of doing telemedicine while the couch and so forth. That's a very, it's going to be a very hard social transition for some people to make who really appreciate that separation. So I think it's something you have to appreciate from a mental health point of view, just from a societal separation point of view. And those things are going to look more blended than ever. And it's going to be hard for people to make the adjustments. So I'm just going to note that and I'll let Esteban say more. Well, let me just comment real quick and then give it to Esteban. So if you look at really wealthy people, they mix business and social all the time. Uh, so they're never not in business, but they're never not in social also. And, and to make that work requires a lot of uh, sort of self-discipline and entrepreneurial spirit to sort of figure out what you're not seeing and, and go after it. And so that may be the sort of core of a lot of the transition is, is uh, uh, companies need to stop you know, ordering people around like they're yeah. machines and, and really, you know, walk the walk of, you've got to let your employees, the people who work with you, be true partners and entrepreneurs so that they can uh, build these sort of things because you can't control that. Esteban, um, tell us your thoughts about this. 
Oh, you're, you're muted, Esteban. Sorry about that. I mean, trying to get the, the hint of this. So because we have been working on inequality for a long time, the, one, the immediate thing that we did is to look at what are the social groups, groups which are affected more by social distancing. I mean, the fact that they can do it or not, that they can afford it. The, the second thing is the social groups, groups which are affected more by the, actually the, the epidemic. And the preliminary results that we have for New York is that obviously poor people cannot afford to social distance as rich people, uh, as a wealthy people, wealthy people. And although uh, income is actually um, one of the, I mean, you can see that the main driving um, demographic trait is education. Uh, we can see, for example, that people that have uh, low education at time and are actually the ones that are still going outside and going and working at the groceries and actually working in the supply chain because those, those jobs are basically uh, physical and they are low paid and those are the ones. And the people that have more than, let's say, uh, college or bachelor um, studies, they are staying home. Those are the ones that can social distance themselves. Also, the number of people that uh, are infected, the recent uh, data about New York uh, by census track, you can see that uh, there are more infections and more people going to the hospital in poor areas than rich areas. So this, this is actually something that happened every season of the flu, uh, even though uh, during the season of the flu, even though people get infected uh, by, by, the, by, the, by the flu, uh, the number of people that go to hospital is much larger in low income groups than in high, in high income groups. So not only the flu, but also the coronavirus is affecting more of these low income groups. So, I think for the better future, we have to uh, realize that this is happening, that uh, there are uh, parts of our society pockets, both in terms of education and also income, which are uh, differently affected by, by, the, by the epidemics. And we don't, we, we, have to, we don't have to leave them behind because the, the, the chances are that these people are gonna be uh, close in their, in their groups. They're not gonna have, gonna have help. So we have to actually uh, keep in mind that this, these communities are more affected by both the social distancing and also the epidemics. You're on mute, Sandy. Thank you. Yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, we need to think about different strategies for different socioeconomic groups. So the final question is to Kent. And uh, the question is, New York's doing a lot of what you suggest. But why, are, why is New York hit so hard? Well, that's a very good question. And, and uh, cities like Singapore, Seoul, Hong Kong, Shanghai were, were not hit nearly as hard. And I think the, the main difference is they acted very quickly with really aggressive testing. And it wasn't just COVID-19 testing. They set up fever clinics. They take your temperature. They did CT scans. Uh, they would um, give you a flu test. And uh, if, if flu wasn't... Uh, identified, they, then they would give you a COVID-19 test. Uh, if you were positive for that, they didn't send you home because 80% of the transmission apparently happened in households to other family members. They sent you to a place to recuperate in isolation. And um, New York didn't do any of that. I mean, we, New York is much more aggressive than uh, Florida or Georgia, uh, and they, <laughs> they will be hit there. Uh, it's, I think it's just a lack of, a lack of leadership and, and an inability to get ahead of this. So it's always it's striking when you see the people's descriptions about Singapore and places like that. The temperature sensors are everywhere. everywhere. Every time you go in a building, every single time. Uh, and as Kevin was saying, those are actually surprisingly effective. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if you had a high temperature, they immediately gave you a flu test, a regular flu test. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, they pulled you off, gave you this flu test. If you didn't have flu, you were isolated. Uh, yeah. They didn't mm -hmm. have to test you for COVID because there weren't a lot of options at that point. As you said, they don't send you home. They send you someplace for, for isolation. Right. So yeah, we cool. need to sort of up our game everywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we've been a little lazy as a, as a culture. Mm -hmm. So an interesting yeah. issue, Sandy, is, is uh, a lot of people quite say density is a problem. I mean, these high density cities actually managed it really effectively. There were yeah. single points of control. When you would enter into an apartment building or an office building in Hong Kong, as you say, they would do an electronic fever test, but they also had hand washing stations. You couldn't enter the building with, or leave the building for that matter without washing your hands or, or disinfecting them. 
but right. we don't do any of that. Yeah. So those are some like things that we have to like really make a priority. Wearing masks is another one. I know that helps. <laughs> yeah, I noticed in the grocery store near me just recently, they started having a hand sanitizing station right in front at the front door, which, which is a good move, but a little late, <laughs> you know. Okay, folks uh, online, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank all of you for great talks. It, it is very synergistic. I think we're all coming to some sort of vision of the new future. Uh, now we have to work on that and build it. So. Thank you all and uh, uh, have a good day. Take care. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. Sandy.